try to talk softer now. Yeah. Introductions, they're a lot like social media. It doesn't give you the whole picture, picture, right? And we all go through challenges. We all go through difficulties in raising our kids. And um, we have some awesome kids. But um, it's live and learn, right? Amen. And, you know, it's just all a matter of perspective. And uh, my, va- my Valerie right there, uh, my wife of 30 years, no, 35 No, 38. (laughs) It's all a matter of perspective. (laughs) Just the last week, I was, I was, in fact, I was just, I was challenging with a difficult situation and circumstance and, you know, uh, just wasn't having the right perspective on, on the situation and circumstance. And Valerie, she looks at me and she says, are you, are you taking this at, at face value or faith value? Okay, I hear that. Kind of reminded me of a man that was, he was arguing with his wife and they were driving through, the, driving through the countryside and they drove past this farm that had some cows and some pigs and, and the guy, the husband, was a little angry and pointed his finger at his wife and says, you, you see those animals? They remind me of your relatives. She said, yep, my in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> Also, Jason, he says to me, he says, you know, we, we try to end hard fast at 1130. I go, what if we need to go into overtime? <laughs> Just a matter of perspective, right? <laughs> what you see determines what you'll be. How you view things will determine your success or your failure, ultimately. And I have a question for you this morning. What do you do when things don't go your way? When things don't go your way, when things go wrong, my attitude is the only thing that I have complete control over. Right? I don't don't have control over the virus. I don't have control over the politicians that are in D.C. or in Illinois. I don't have control over any of those things, but I do have control over my own attitude and my own perspective and the way that I want to look at these things. So my question to you today, are you willing to grow your ability to adjust your attitude? Huh? Are you you open to that? So we're in church. I need some honesty now. Now, this is a show of hands. And again, be honest. How many of you woke up grumpy today? Just this side. There's, oh, there. How many of you just let her sleep? Okay. Okay. All right. Oh, wait. Did I take that back? <laughs> uh, maturity is, is conquering our natural impulses, including our attitude. Either Jesus will calm the storm or he'll calm you in the storm. And it's just a matter of perspective. Paul, the apostle, he says in Philippians 4.12, he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every, say, in any and every. Whoa, maturity talking. Being content in any and every situation. He had been through a lot of bad situations. And the passage that I'm going to take a look at this morning is one that where it took place in Philippi, uh, had its humble beginnings in Philippi. It takes place where Paul began to initiate a ministry that was incredibly powerful. So I find out the key to managing my attitude is fixing my perspective. Fixing my perspective. There was this, there was this company that uh, they, were having some, they were having some real struggles with their product. They had some electric motorbikes. Uh, mountain bikes and they were sending them all over the world and they were having them come back damaged over and over and over again and they were just losing incredible amount of finances and so they brought in some of the their lead team and they they tried to discuss well should we change the routing no not yet should we change the routing or the okay it's too late (laughs) 
Should we change the routing? Or we change the delivery system? Or what should we do? And they basically just said, you know, that'll, that'll just cost more money. And so one of the young guys on their leadership team says, you know, I've got an idea. You know, these boxes that we send these TVs in, you know, they're, or these bicycles in, <laughs> they're about the size of a television set. So why don't we just kind of put a, a television on the side, a TV on the side of the box, and we'll ship it this way. And so what ended up happening is they found that their damages dropped by 80%. Because the people that were delivering had changed their perspective of the box. When they saw that it was a mountain bike, they thought they could handle it anyway. It was tough. It's rough. You know, just throw it in there, right? But when they saw the TV picture on the box, they kind of were a little bit more delicate. So you can change the way you view your circumstances, right? And how you view the challenge that's ahead of you. In Acts 6, see three incredible perspectives. Paul goes through three incredible shifts in his perspective. And if you can learn to implement these in your life, you will see incredible changes in your own perspective. So the first one. A new perspective on closed doors. A new perspective on closed doors. In Acts 16, 6, it says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. And then he goes on and says that there was a closed door in Bithynia, and then they ended up going on to Troas. And so we have a, a map here. I want to kind of show you this map. So this is where they were headed. They were up in the um, Asia Minor area, and they were trying to go into Phrygia. They were going into Galatia. But the Holy Spirit kept blocking their path. So then they went on to Troas, which is the next, the next image. They went on to Troas. And then all of a sudden, they had, Paul had this vision. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia, or modern Greece, and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we, and it turns into we now, and Luke, so is, Luke is with them, the writer of the book of Acts, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So they go across the Aegean Sea, into Europe. This is the first time that the gospel goes into Europe, the nation of Euro the European continent. And it's all because they didn't get to go where they wanted to go, that they ended up where they needed to be. I, I want to say that one more time. It was because they didn't get to go where they wanted to go that they end up, ended up being where they needed to to be. You got to think and pause on that statement for just a minute. Maybe you had a graduation that you didn't get to have. Maybe a job had to close down. A wedding situation. A job loss that you didn't get. I'm wondering if you can relabel that. Relabel that circumstance. Can you see roadblocks as reroutes? This roadblock image up here. Can you see roadblocks as reroutes? Can you see rejection as redirection? Let me explain it this way. It's, it's easy to stop and stare. It's easy to stop and stare at that sign. You come up to that sign, and you're just like, oh, my gosh, you know? And then you get nervous, you get anxious, right? Because you got to get to where you need to go. And you sit, and you wish things were different. Instead of trusting God to be working in and through the circumstances to get you to where you really need to be. Actually, you're not stopped. You're just being rerouted. Because God ultimately is going to get you to where he needs you to be. Yeah. Last winter, uh, 
I was dropping off some food for a, a shut-in gentleman, a senior that, um, yeah, we went through the snow. We, it was really hard to get to his house, and it was in a place that I'd never been before, so, you know, you're using your GPS, and so, anyhow, I drop it off, and I'm still kind of not sure how to get back to the main road. Once I get there, then I know how to get home. So I put the GPS back on, and I, I kind of know the road that I turned on to get to his house, and it's not taking me that direction. It just keeps rerouting me. And then I, I see that up ahead on the GPS that it's like taking a left when it should be taking a right and going a different direction. And I'm just like, no, I am not going to obey this. I know that I should be taking a right. I should be going west, not east. And so, you know, I take it into my own hands. The GPS, you don't know better. Anyhow, I get finally kind of maneuver my way and it kind of re it keeps trying to get me back, but I keep fighting and then it keeps, you know, okay, I'll let you go now. And so I get to the main road and I get down about, I don't know, 200 feet and it's blocked. There's been a tragic accident and I am stuck on that road for 30 minutes or more when I could have been home probably in five minutes, right? I saw the roadblock and I resisted it. I tried to fight through it. I just wasn't willing to let it be, reroute me to the path that was really the best path, right? And that's oftentimes the way the Holy Spirit works. Even in this COVID situation, you know, you're just, we had these mission teams and it was all set. People had given their money and COVID hits and, and we can't go. And then all of a sudden, I am told about this virtual experience to India thing. And I'm thinking, oh, that's crazy. Virtual experience, that's not going to work, Right? Well, anyhow, we ended up going through and connecting with uh, this global emissions agency to do this virtual India experience. We ended up having almost 70 people sign up for this virtual India experience. And sometimes it's hard to get 10 people to a missions trip, right? Hello? And now all of a sudden, now kids, kids are meeting missionaries on screen and where they live in India and all these things. I thought, why didn't we think of this before? I said, even if we take, full, if we take on in-person mission trips from now on, I think we're going to have an, an added virtual experience for those that don't go with us, but they can follow us. I go, we, we learn, it's not a roadblock. This COVID thing, masking, oh, I don't know what all your thoughts are on that, but you know what? It just will re redirect the church. It's going to help us navigate. We just need to let God help us navigate through this to do what it is that God's called us to do, and God's church will not be thwarted through what's going on all around us. We may have a roadblock, but we will be rerouted, and God's church will have an impact. Yes. Hello. Amen. Yeah. A new perspective on closed doors. A new perspective on disappointment. The second thing. A new perspective. Paul had a new perspective on this trip of disappointment. Across the Aegean Sea, the first city they land in, as I mentioned, was Philippi. And they were expecting to find a Jewish synagogue. This is the way it's always been done. I go into a place, I find a Jewish synagogue, there's at least a core of people to work with, then we plan a church and preach the gospel, right? That's the way we do it. This is the way we begin ministry in every town we've gone into all this point. But he goes into Philippi and there is no synagogue. Not enough Jewish men to even establish a synagogue. And what's interesting is that Philippi is a Roman colony founded for Rome, Roman soldiers' retirement. <laughs> it's a whole community of Roman soldiers Super patriotic, don't speak Greek, only speak Latin, very prejudiced against the Jews, a totally different culture, a totally different atmosphere than what he has ever experienced in his life. And he's got disappointment. There's no synagogue. There's nobody to work with. Their whole ministry model, dude, out the window. <laughs> it's gone. 
And I just want to just like say another thing. That uh, Just insert a note here. I, I, I work with a local church in the Chicago area, and we do a lot of things in the community. We give out food. We do a lot of things. But, you know, I, I, I was very frustrated with the fact that we were not seeing a break in the cycle of poverty. We were given food and we were, we were given fish, but not teaching people how to fish. And it's all good. We need to give food and we need to give the resources that will help people. I, we do that. But I was like, God, what, what else can we be doing? There's no Jewish synagogue here. We've got, we've got to find something different. And so the Lord brought uh, Christians Against Poverty, the ministry that I now do some consulting with, into my purview. They're a ministry of 25 years of experience of helping people that are in crisis, unmanageable debt, find Jesus in their felt needs, but then also help them out of debt, buried in debt, bring freedom to them financially and emotionally, but then also bring Jesus into the picture so that they can be free spiritually. And they have seen over time, the largest, they're the largest ministry in the UK, by far the largest ministry. Then they launched into the Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and then the Lewis Palau Evangelistic Association invited them to come to the U.S. two years ago. And then they reached out to me because I'm a Chicago person and that's where their office is set up. And they said, will you help us engage churches? Give us some traction in, a, in, in the United States. And so that's what I've done. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to gain some traction. We're trying to get churches involved in what we're doing. And uh, we saw almost, we've seen almost 16,000 people come to faith through Christians Against Poverty efforts, through the local church. And so I'd really love for you to consider maybe possibly uh, giving a monthly pledge to this ministry. We have a book of our founder, Start at Rock Bottom, Financial Wizard Lost Everything, and then... God just got a hold of his heart, and he then began to help people get out of debt. He started Christians Against Poverty. His story is so incredibly powerful. We have a book out there, and all you have to do is write out your information on the left-hand side of that document you have there, hand it in, and we'll give you a book uh, for free. We've got to change sometimes. On the Sabbath, it says, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate in verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and we began to speak to the women who had been gathered there. They expected to find a place of prayer. Whenever possible, urban synagogues would be built near rivers or springs so that members could purify their, themselves before they would come into the synagogue. And so oftentimes synagogues would be found by a river. So he was just hoping, maybe expecting that there would be some men <laughs> down by the river. But what he finds is, a, is a, some, some women. <laughs> so I, I pulled this off the internet. I thought, okay, here's Paul. This is a show. Look at his face. He's just like, oh my gosh, God, really? Honestly? A bunch of women right? But then on the left-hand side, there's a woman called Lydia, a seller in purple cloth, a businesswoman, right? What's crazy is there's no man in Macedonia. He gets this Macedonian call with a vision from a man, <laughs> and there's no man there. <laughs> I think God's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> it says one of those, those listening, in verse 14, it says one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira or in Asia Minor, named Lydia. So she was from where Paul just came from. She probably had a home there, because she did, she, she was a dealer in fabric to rich people, the purple cloth, it was fancy, it was rich. And then she was here doing some trading, and all of a sudden, Holy Spirit, God, Paul, right? She was a worshiper of God, so that means that she was, she was interested, she was curious in the God of Abraham. But then the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. She was this traveling Gentile woman, but she was the first European convert. What is, what is amazing is that God has great plans for you. 
I, I mean, think about it. Paul was wanting to go to, into Asia Minor. He was wanting to revisit the churches that were planted there, maybe plant some more churches. It was all good. It was a good thing. But it wasn't the best thing. It wasn't what God had intended. He wanted some more churches in Asia Minor, but God wanted him to go to Europe and start a whole new revolution on the European continent. Our plans are much too small. The roadblocks, the disappointments, the things that we go through. Paul would have never met Lydia if his original plans had not been shipwrecked. Hear me out. Paul's original plans, they would have never happened. He would have never met Lydia if he hadn't had his plans shipwrecked. Now, I want to say, don't make a mistake. Think changeable tactics for unchangeable goals. You know, the goals remain the same. Think about it. The, the goals are unchangeable. We want to bring the gospel. We want to see people saved, right? But we may have to change our tactics once in a while. Right? The way we always done things. We're so good at being, you know, consistent, but sometimes we need to change things up. Get boring a little bit, right? Paul's goal was to spread the gospel but the Jewish synagogue and using men, God was up to a different tactic in Europe. Yeah, yeah Jewish men, no Jewish men. Let's preach to the Jewish women. No, oh. this wasn't normal. A new perspective on disappointment. Right? Back to the story. Huh. Lydia. What's, so, what's, what's really amazing about Lydia, too? is that Lydia ends up financing the rest of Paul's missionary work throughout Europe. She's giving financially, sending money to him on a regular basis so that he can preach the gospel. Dude, God has a plan, man. I mean, we, may, we have our own way of doing things, right? Many are the plans in a man's heart. But the Lord, the Lord orders our steps the Lord sees, he knows, he is orchestrating. Yes. So we've got to have a different perspective, right? Yeah. Different perspective on closed doors, a different perspective on disappointments. And then a new perspective, my last point, and I'll try to close down here. Just for my, yeah. A new perspective on hardship, on hardship, crisis. In that same place, Paul meets this possessed female woman, a slave. Some scholars say she was probably 10 to 14 years old. And the way they did it back then is that they would traffic these women. And they would tell them to go out and just say crazy things, just go ballistic, go nuts. And she was, she was demon-possessed. The Bible says she had a demon. But her, her traffickers would say, go out there, wreak havoc, and then we'll come in and save the day. We'll tell people what exactly you really mean and then manipulate the circumstance so they could get their money and do whatever it is that they were wanting to do. You know, what's another thing? It's interesting, the contrast between Lydia and this girl. Okay, Lydia, wealthy, financially stable, you know, and God touches her heart, saves her. This 10 to 14-year-old demon-possessed girl, abused, being trafficked, hurt, rejected. And Jesus now is reaching out to her. Paul doesn't understand it. He doesn't see the whole per picture. But God has his finger on this girl. Maybe we see ourselves in the, Lydia, in the Lydia framework, or maybe we're this young lady who's been hurt and abused and used. But man, the Holy Spirit loves and cares for each. It right? has a plan to reach both the outcast, which is my passion through CAP, and those that are well off. It says in verse 19 and 20, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities and magistrates and said, these men are Jews. 
race, racism here, right? These men are Jews, and they are throwing the city into an uproar. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods the size of a baseball bat. That's what a Roman rod was the size of a baseball bat, and they were brutally, brutally beating Paul and those that were a part of his team. It says they were severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer, who was not a nice guy, by the way, you know, he he didn't have to just throw, just put, he could have just put them in jail. But he seizes them, and he commits, he he, the jailer says, when the jailer received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks about midnight. What is it about midnight? There's something about midnight. Usually it's me, it's about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. That's, that's when I really wrestle with things. <laughs> Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Verse 24 speaks of the inner cell. This would have struck fear in the hearts of anyone that was in that time period. It was the lowest cell. It was where all the drainage of urine and all the refuge would come through the walls down to the final drain of the lowest cell. They were stripped. They were naked. They had been beaten. They had been thrown into the lowest cell. They were sitting and laying in... You can imagine the stench and the smell, darkness, publicly humiliated, victims of racism. Now what do you do? It says in verse 25, about midnight. Mm. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Perspective on hardship Hello? I don't think I've ever gotten to that place of hardship and crisis in my life. And the other prisoners were listening to them. People are watching us. What does singing praises in your midnight in prison do for your perspective? Huh? It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? Are you seeing things at face value or faith value? What it does is you're not seeing the big picture because you're too zoomed in, right? I want to show this last, this last photo. <laughs> How many know what this is? Any, any guess? It, it, it is hair. But it's an eyelash. Kind of gross, right? (laughs) The thing about being so zoomed into the situation and circumstances that you have, you don't see the big picture because you're too zoomed in. If we would have zoomed out, you would see a beautiful eyelid, well done by a beautiful model kind of thing. But it doesn't look so pretty here, right? When I worship in my jail cell at midnight, it zooms out my perspective. I start getting a God perspective. My heart begins to open up to all the possibilities and not all the probabilities. When I worship in my jail cell, instead of looking at my problems microscopically, it helps me just get an effective perspective, right? It just it just my, my my perspective on earth. It gives me a big picture view. If God hadn't redirected Paul again, he wouldn't have been able to experience all the things that he experienced. He wouldn't have met the jailer. He wouldn't have met the girl, right? That was demon possessed. And he wouldn't have met Lydia. And all of them needed the gospel, and Europe needed the gospel. And God had it all, the closed doors, the disappointments, the crisis. Even through the crisis, the jailer comes to faith because of the power of God that's released in that circumstance, in that situation, right? 
I guess hindsight is always better than foresight, right? When you're in it and the difficulty of it, the challenge is there. But if we can somehow get that perspective, that big perspective, we've got to be willing to develop and embrace the closed doors, the disappointments, and the hardships. These things shaped Paul's ministry. Suffering is a box that has been delivered to your doorstep. Difficulties, the challenges, the crisis are boxes that have been delivered to your doorstep. Either you're going to relabel it and embrace it as something that God will work through, that God will reroute, that God will make something good out of something bad. Or we're going to remain frustrated, fretful, angry. We've got to learn to sing praises at midnight. New perspective on closed doors, disappointments, and hardships. So, uh, I'll just close with this question. Who, who do you relate to more in this story? Lydia or the girl? I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're in between somewhere. But we all need Jesus, right? And so, I want to open this up. I'm just going to pray. And if you're here and... Maybe you don't have a relationship. Maybe you, you're searching Christianity. Maybe you, um, it's not like you have great needs, but yet your heart is looking for something more. You believe in the God of the Bible, but you just don't have that peace. And God wants to give that to you today. Maybe you're in a struggling situation, an abusive situation, a difficult. Maybe you've been raised in a difficult situation. You're a Christian, but you're still struggling with your past to get perspective on why that happened. God has a plan. He knows the plans he has for you, and that is to prosper you and give you hope in the future. And we've got to believe that and trust that God is in it. So, Father, I'm, uh, I'm just asking you to, Holy Spirit, to come minister by your spirit here, Lord, in these few minutes. There are people here that are going through hardship. Maybe not to the severest side of this, but they're going through hardship. They're going through disappointment. And maybe they had a, a door closed. Or know of people that did. And they're wrestling with their own forgiveness toward you. Holy Spirit, come and bring healing. Bring your healing to this place, to those that are here. Bring freedom from the anxiety, freedom from the oppression. We command it to be lifted by the power of the Holy Spirit off of those that are being suffocated. We command that suffocation to cease, those lies to cease, those voices to stop lying in the name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and give us new life, new and fresh vision for what things could be and can be if we give them and surrender them to you. And we ask it all in the precious name. Pastor Dave, can we just show some honor to <clears throat> how many of you that spoke to you this morning? God spoke to you through that message. Amen. Um, I want to give you an opportunity. Um, uh, Pastor Dave did not ask this, but I feel it, it hit me as he was preaching about the Lydia. And uh, you know, we make every effort to just bring people that we really believe in uh, in front of this body of believers. I think there's just such health in hearing from men and women of God who God has really worked in their lives and there's a, a maturity there. I think some of you have an opportunity to be a Lydia perhaps in the shorts life. 
And I love your vision and your heart. You know, I, I know from 30 years of knowing you that when you are redirected, I know when he preaches that message, guys, he, I've heard all the stories, Pastor Dave. I'm going to have you come and talk about Coach Dempsey sometime. Is it Dempsey? Is that the last name? Um, he was a, he didn't share this, but he was a, uh, a outstanding college football player. It was uh, Southern Illinois. Is that right? Carbondale. And got saved through a, an angry, mean coach, football coach. And you, you hated him. And it was your first big obstacle. You didn't even know Jesus. And then uh, one day he came back for a new season of football at SIU and Coach Dempsey was different because he'd found Jesus. And it changed you. And, and from that day forward, after you gave your life to Christ, I've never seen you. I mean, you guys do crazy stuff. I don't even understand your life. Nancy and I are crazy, but you're nuts. <laughs> God says go left and they go, okay, how far? And just, it's amazing. I, I'd like to stand behind So I'm going to ask two things. If you want to, if anyone, and this is not planned and was not asked for, but if anyone just feels compelled, I, I've read about CAP, Christians Against Property, and what you're doing. And, and um, if you feel compelled to give to this couple, I would, I, I would encourage you to do so. And uh, if you would like to give to them, you could write a check, put it into our offering basket out in the lobby, and just put Dave on it, and we'll make sure, Dave or CAP, and we'll make sure that gets to them. But also consider what God use you to help support them on a monthly basis. I pray that there might be a few people that just have that Lydia ability, that Lydia calling, even if it's just a little bit every month, I, I feel compelled. How many times have we done this? Not many a journey. I feel it on my heart this morning to give you guys that opportunity to give. But Father, we thank you. Just bow your head with me this morning, would you? Father, we thank you for um, this message of hope. And we just want to close it out well. I, I just want to I'm not going to invite anyone up, but I, I, I just want to, by raise of hands, um, just ask you this morning, is there anybody in this place that you um, either are facing closed doors and you need a new perspective or you, you have a disappointment in your life? Maybe it's a huge thing and you need a, a new perspective. You're facing hardships and you need a new perspective. Maybe you're even in that jail cell or you feel like it just acknowledge that, God, I'm in one of those situations, and God, I need a new perspective this morning. We just raise your hand up to the Lord just as a point of response. Yeah, lots of hands. Father, I do just agree with Pastor Dave. Lord, just move powerfully in these lives. Do something amazing. Lord Jesus, minister and move powerfully, Holy Spirit. God, I, I just want to thank you that you've given us brothers and sisters in Christ to walk this out with. And God, I pray specifically over Journey Church, really over all the churches of this city. But God, over this one where we have responsibility and where we walk, God, would you help us to, to just really dig in and get to be a body of believers that knows each other and loves each other well. Friends, I heard that so many times at, at our fall festival yesterday that there's just a hunger and a desire to know people and to be known. So Holy Spirit, let us be a great example of what it means to truly love one another as the body of Christ. Let the love and just the, not, not the laxness, but the, the true love uh, uh, that we show among each other as believers be so attractive to that lost world. And God, I pray that just as in the book of Acts, daily you would add to the number of those who are being saved in this place. God, we love you. We bless Pastor Dave and Valerie, and we thank you for this awesome time. In Jesus' name in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Again, can we just show our appreciation for Pastor Dave and Val? Listen, no joke, if you need prayer over any of those things, I'm going to be up here for a little while. Um, Nancy, can you get me that? This is very important. This is the most important part before everyone goes. Can you help me out here? I got a mic in my hands. This is, so, so, the, all right, <laughs> you know what I'm doing. He's rolling his eyes. So Damon came up to me at the fall festival yesterday, and he goes, <clears throat> where'd you get that flannel shirt? And it was just this kind of old, dumpy flannel shirt. And I said, well, I, I think I got it from my father-in-law. He goes, well, you didn't get it from my father-in-law. Let me get you a good flannel shirt. So this is a, this is a Damon Absey. Yeah, tell me out here, would you? I, I, this is a brief, um, yeah. If you need a flannel shirt, then you need to go to Dave, Damon Absey flannel shirt. 
what is it? Five Brothers brand. I, I feel like compelled to do this. This is really embarrassing, but that's okay. I'm embarrassed all the time. All right. So, Damon, if you need a good flannel shirt, thank you, Nancy. Here it is, you guys. Right here, Damon Apsey. He's got a load of these. Let's hear it for awesome flannel shirts. Hey, I, I'm wearing this as an example because we actually need some men, even if you don't have a flannel shirt. We've got a few um, of our uh, um, tents that we have set up in back. If we could get about five or ten guys to help out for about 10 to 15 minutes in tearing down some of the tents that we have in the back and putting those away, that would be really awesome. Maybe you could meet Damon and Josh just out back here in about five minutes. That would be awesome. Guys, you're awesome. We love you. Praise the Lord. It's been a good Sunday. We'll see you next week. Amen. Oh, yeah, no youth tonight and visionary parenting in two weeks. We have an advertisement uh, out on Facebook for that. Really, really encourage you to come to that. It's going to be great. Bless you guys. Have a great week. Thank you.